I did things. I willingly chose to do things to hurt other people and myself because it caused them pain. Not because I didn't know it was wrong, but because I wanted to cause them pain. I am essentially me from Catfish with how good I am at online stalking. I have been facing stalking, harassment, and threats from one very recognizable source. I have this old homeless buddy who genuinely likes to f with me now. Not even more pathetic than you already are. Why do you look desperate? Everyone gossips, everyone lies, everyone acts different on social media than they do in real life. But the question is, how far is too far? How many lies before they spiral out of control and you dig yourself a hole that you can't climb out of? And how many people do you need to hurt before you're deemed a monster? Very few YouTubers have been exposed as monsters on the platform, but whenever a dark truth about a YouTuber is uncovered, it lights the internet ablaze and the internet explodes with content about this controversy. Today we're going to be discussing some very serious allegations, ones that I'm inclined to believe due to the nature of the evidence and proof provided. This stalking campaign has lasted the better part of a decade and while I didn't know who my stalker was before, now I know who my stalker is. My stalker is Shannon, better known as Creepshow Art and what I believe to be her current husband, Anthony Parker. There's like a lot of emotions, very disappointed, very sad hurt. Um, there's a lot. But today we're going to be talking about everything that's been going on with Shannon from Creep Show Art and everything that's been brought to light. And the latest YouTuber who's now sparked a wildfire of controversy is the YouTuber Creep Show Art. But how did this art YouTuber? When I post my art, I actually live to see how people interact with it and how people respond to it. The fact that I can make something that people actually look at and let, you know, roll around in their brain. That makes me happy. So quickly become known as this person. Creepshow had been posing as her own fans and haters for approximately three years. Emily Artful, a YouTuber that makes similar types of content, dropped a video stating that Creepshow's partner had been stalking her for the past decade and that Creepshow had been getting involved recently. How did the YouTuber known to kindly shout out friends in videos like these? And Madeline Static here on YouTube or it's Maffy over on Twitter if you want to go check her out. Please do check them the heckles Stiltskin out, they are amazing. Get exposed for talking about their closest friends behind their backs. No matter how guilty I feel over all the nice things that she's done to me, the sadness for everybody else affected by her actions and those threads and what Emily's had to go through outweighs that by far. How does a YouTuber who claimed to be homeless- Do you know how many people I lied to and did not tell I was homeless to while I was homeless? Put another person in a situation where they were homeless. Creep show and Andrea, her husband allegedly used revenge and acted in such a way as to get Emily fired from her job and then lead Emily to homelessness. And how does a person who claimed to have an internet stalker... I had deleted all of the emails since I had been getting them. I had only realized when I said it out loud to my boyfriend the first time how stupid that was. End up being an internet stalker. This stalking campaign has lasted the better part of a decade. And while I didn't know who my stalker was before, now I know who my stalker is. My stalker is Shannon, better known as Creepshow Art. And is it all true? But before we get into the Creepshow art situation, 
This video is sponsored by Blue Land. I recently moved to a new home, which I feel like is always a great time to declutter. And something I've been really focused on lately is cutting down the amount of waste that my household produces. Blue Land offers more sustainable options for your everyday household products. Blue Land uses no single use plastic in any component from bottles to tablets to wrappers to even shipping materials. Their products are vegan and cruelty free and they're also made with clean ingredients, meaning products are made with no ammonia, chlorine bleach, or parabens. Blue Land is also EPA certified, meaning EPA scientists have evaluated every ingredient in the product to make sure it meets safer choices stringent criteria. With Blue Land, you can save money and space without the plastic waste. And it's just a no brainer to me that I feel like fits into any household. All you need to clean your home is just a nickel sized tablet. I used to pay around five to six dollars for a cleaning product or hand soap, but with Blue Land, all you have to pay is two dollars for a single tablet. And the price goes as low as 155 if you buy in bulk. And it's so easy and simple to use Blue Land products. First, you fill your forever bottle with warm to hot water. Then you drop one of the tablets into the water bottle and put the nozzle on after the tablet fully dissolves. You can then use the product in minutes with no shaking and no stirring needed. I received the foaming hand soap kit from Blue Land. I love the scents of the tablets and my favorite two are lavender eucalyptus and iris agave. It's now been almost two months that I've been using the hand soap. The tablets definitely go a long way and I feel I've certainly gotten a huge bang for my buck. And I really think anyone can get a lot of use out of Blue Land. All you have to do is click the link in my description and get 20% off your first Blue Land kit. So thank you so much to Blue Land for sponsoring this video and thank you to anyone who clicks the link in the description to help out the channel. I really hope that you enjoy the service as much as I have been. And now let's get into the video and this creep show art situation. Before we can understand the massive downfall of Creepshow art unlike anything seen on YouTube before, we have to understand how this all started. Who is Creepshow art? And how did this massive YouTube scandal come about? Shannon Margaret Campbell was born in the United States on May 13th, 1993. Better known online as Creepshow art, she created her YouTube channel on April 4th of 2016. Creepshow art was one of the largest voices in the YouTube drama slash comedy commentary community. At her peak, Creepshow Art accumulated over 500,000 subscribers on the platform. She started out in ArtTube, the YouTube niche where artists record themselves drawing and commentate over the footage. She then segued into talking about YouTube and internet drama and quickly exploded from there. Before Shannon's big controversies, she was most known for some of the initial larger videos she made and was also known for talking very openly about having experienced homelessness. When I was homeless, I had such genuinely terrible experiences while showering at public gyms that the concept of showering became a massive source of stress for me. Having a phone feels like a luxury even when you have nothing. And making sure it has a solid charge despite the use you're going to want to get out of it, that's hard. Shannon was also perceived by the commentary community to have a very friendly face who had a close relationship with a lot of other YouTubers in the commentary space. Two notable, incredible commentary creators on the platform who Shannon was very friendly with were D'Angelo Wallace and Ready to Glare. She'd been my close friend for years. A lot of people have said that Shannon's overly friendly nature towards a lot of these YouTubers was an example of love bombing, but I definitely won't be categorizing Shannon's actions as love bombing personally. First off, because I am not a psychologist, I have no authority to say what is or isn't love bombing. And also YouTube is a really lonely job where it's really hard to make friends. And and I sometimes get really excited when meeting new friends and new people. So who am I to say what is love bombing and isn't love bombing? And just in general, I won't be diagnosing Shannon in this video or using any words that can be attributed to a diagnosis, but Shannon was definitely very complimentary of her fellow creator friends. Shannon shouted out lots of creators in her videos and interacted with a lot of them online. I have spoken to Creepshow Art or Shannon on multiple occasions, both 
in private and public settings. She has supported me multiple times on her own channel, even shouting me out at times and commenting on my videos in support of my content. One huge example of this was on her video titled The Worst Mommy Vlogger Ever, where she spent like two whole minutes just ranting and raving about my channel and how much she enjoys it, which I honestly really appreciated. But what people didn't know is that there was a much darker and sinister side to Shannon that was about to come out, and an entire YouTube community was rocked to its core. Now, the most recent controversy with Creepshow Art was not the first controversy and drama. In fact, Shannon had a way of finding drama almost as soon as she started making popular videos. On March 4th of 2020, Creepshow Art uploaded a video titled, Jaclyn Hill's Dad is a Cult Leader. We are going to be talking about how Jaclyn Hill, the biggest pathological liar on YouTube, we're talking about how her dad is a cult leader. That is right, my dude. He's a cult leader in Africa. Where she talked about the beauty you YouTuber Jacqueline Hill, whose estranged father was an alleged cult leader in Africa. Jacqueline was quick to respond to these allegations and told Shannon to mind their damn business. I wouldn't give a crap about the parents of that person. I wouldn't look into them. I wouldn't think they were anything relevant to it. I wouldn't give even one or two poops about it. Except for the fact that Jim, Jimmy boy, Jim Bulls over here, is a bona fide cult leader. Which of course such a huge YouTuber with millions of followers responding to your video is bound to blow it up and is definitely an example of where controversy can actually work in your favor. Even though, in hindsight, the video is kind of intrusive on a private matter and also makes a lot of insinuations that because Jacqueline's dad is a cult leader, someone who's been estranged from her life for years, that relates to Jacqueline's actions and her being a bad person, which I think is a stretch and not necessarily a fair conclusion to make. Jacqueline also responded to the video saying, this is is absolutely disgusting. I refuse to watch this video, but just the title and the thumbnail is so awful. What is wrong with you that you think it's okay to even speak about my birth father when I haven't even spoke to him in 10 years? I understand that people don't like me. They think I'm a liar. They feel as though they can't trust me. I can't change that. But seriously, it's gone too far. People have taken away all the fun on social media and have made it so ugly. I'm truly sick of seeing it every day. However, when people tried to explain to Shannon that her comments were in poor taste, she just doubled down on her arguments and stated, Got to be honest, but if anyone, famous or not, has a father that says he publicly cured AIDS by touching someone or speaking to them, I'm talking about it. I don't really give an F, because what that person did publicly is F'd. But that's not really the point, because you can criticize someone for being a cult leader and simultaneously not link it to their daughter and say comments like, This man is the man who put his hoo-ha into someone else to make Make Jacqueline. So I guess we know where she learned how to boldface lie online so much that she made an entire brand off of it. And I definitely think that that instance is an example of a commentary channel slash drama YouTuber taking things too far, speculating into someone's family relatives, trying to paint an influencer as an even worser person because of who their father is that they were estranged from. I just feel like that's such a dangerous route to take. You don't know what someone's personal life is, what their family situations are. So, will Shannon stop digging into people's private lives or will that continue? It's one thing to get into drama and slight controversy over the content you post and a whole other deal to get into controversy with other YouTubers. But Shannon seemed to have a pattern of latching on to specific people on YouTube, having problems with them, knowing a lot about them, and instigating some drama. And early on, a YouTuber that Shannon specifically latched onto is the YouTuber Hopeless Peaches. Hopeless Peaches is a British YouTuber known for her commentary and art, and her style and format is similar to other art commentary YouTubers, where they create a work of art and then talk over the video about a commentary related topic. Well, uh, then, all of a sudden, Twitter happened. On October 23rd, 2020, she took to Twitter to tweet, I think I'm just about done. Goodbye. This tweet was supposed to imply self-harm and an unaliving attempt that was stopped by a close friend. And the next day, Peaches tweeted, sorry for that last tweet, followed by a video suggestion two days later. But this nonchalant return to social media convinced the YouTuber Prison Mike. Here's Prison Mike. <laughs> 
prison mate Luke that Hopeless Peaches was unaliving themselves baiting and faked a mental health crisis to gain pity from her audience. However, according to Peaches and friends, Peaches, who had spoken openly about her mental health, had genuinely endured a mental health crisis on that day and was on the brink of ending her life. However, Luke doubled down and uploaded a video on December 3rd of 2020 titled Stop Lying Peaches. And I said she was sympathy baiting to her audience by not only constantly saying how she's going to be taking a break for her mental health and never doing it, instead just ignoring what she said and acting like she never posted it. She would also make really serious posts on Twitter saying how she's done goodbye, went offline for half a day, and then acted like it was nothing afterward. And I felt like that wasn't fair to her fans and I called her out for accusing peaches of faking a mental health crisis why someone would feel the need to speculate whether or not someone wants to genuinely end their life i don't know even if someone was maybe doing it for social media attention but also there's a chance they weren't there's other issues in the world that we can talk about here then potentially really hurting someone by claiming that that their mental health problems aren't real and in this video, Shannon got involved and gave testimony against Peaches. Peaches and Creepshow used to be good friends. When Peaches got mad at Creepshow for her Jaclyn Hill video, instead of being a friend and not letting it ruin her friendship with her, she soft blocked Creepshow and started vaguely tweeting about her out of spite. Creepshow Art joined the drama supporting Luke's video on December 2nd by adding her own testimony, then reaffirming her support for Luke's videos in various comment sections and her second video on the subject. And before featuring in this video, Shannon also tweeted out against Hopeless Peaches saying, Before I hit 100k, I was friends with another creator. This creator later spread lies about me, told people I was psychotic, and I screamed at her, and basically poisoned potential friendships with other people in the art community. And then in another tweet, this tweet was about Hopeless Peaches, finding out that she had told multiple creators who she knew I admired that I screamed at her and attacked her when I viewed her as a little sister effing sucked. Those tweets, alongside her feature in Prison Mate Luke's video also encouraged other people to start making videos about Hopeless Peaches. Now that I've gone through the biggest players in the situation, I think it's time I address the community and their reaction. I honestly believe that the community and how they acted is debatably far worse than everyone I've previously mentioned. Hell, only a few days ago, I got this threat in my DMs by a creator who seems lovely in public. And then Shannon proceeded to upload a video on her own channel about Hopeless Peaches titled Hopeless Peaches Needs to Stop, in which she talked about how they were once friends but then fell out. This isn't petty drama for the sake of tea or blood sports online. This is a person going around trying to end people's careers by outright lying about them and then pretending that somehow, someway, because of their lies, they are now the victim. And don't get me wrong, it really sucks to lose a friendship, but someone who's possibly going through a mental health crisis to make a video about them sending drama and controversy their way because you're not friends with them anymore. It's just like, is this the best time to do this? Is this like essential to be public on YouTube? I don't know. But just like imagine you're struggling with your mental health, then you're accused of lying about it, and then a whole group of YouTubers make videos about you. I I mean, that has to be such a traumatic experience to go through, and my heart really goes out to Hopeless Peaches for having to have experienced that. And I also know that a lot of YouTubers who made videos at that time have come out and retracted what they said or apologized. And in Shannon's video, she even went as far as to validate prison mate Luke's claims of Hopeless Peaches having faked her mental health problems. You lied about prison mate Luke saying he was, quote, disappointed you didn't kill yourself, even though that never fucking happened and it's so gross and manipulative to even say that to publicly put that out on multiple videos and in multiple tweets and this video quickly became one of shannon's most popular videos uploaded on her channel and simultaneously gave this whole drama more attention which i'm sure only made things worse for hopeless peaches and it should be noted that despite all the claims shannon made in her initial video she couldn't provide any screenshots or valid pieces of evidence that supported her claims. But the narrative was already out there, and the community 
Cody quickly sided with Shannon, who was considered a trusted source at the time. However, there were a group of YouTubers who were working to debunk a lot of these claims made against Hopeless Peaches. YouTubers like Harley TBS, Just Stop, Just a Robot, and Hopeless Peaches herself. And despite claiming to be such an advocate for mental health, Shannon is now the only YouTuber who has not apologized for the claims she made about Hopeless Peaches. And instead of apologizing, Shannon claimed that Peaches doxed her, which was proven to be false, but caused Peaches to get sent a lot of hate. I was scared of being revenge docked by her friends or fans. So she first defends her twisting my concern for my own safety into saying it was showing context. I don't see how this is showing context. This is literally you trying to spark more drama instead of taking out a small section of your video claiming I was sharing your private information. Shannon also claimed that Peaches never apologized to her when Peaches had, so to me personally, the entire thing was a red flag of Shannon being sort of hellbent on painting Peaches as this really bad person, as Peaches was trying to resolve things with Shannon and create a more peaceful online community. First and foremost, before getting into my side of everything, I wish to apologize and make sure everyone knows I'm not coming into this with ill intent or to pretend I'm without fault. But I mean, Creepshow Art's videos on Peaches got the most views her channel had ever seen. So I'm sure in Shannon's mind, this was a drama that was worth continuing. Shannon was also very aggressive in emails between Peaches and herself, where she would threaten to make more videos on Peaches, providing real evidence this time. This all started because I simply asked out of concern to just take out one accusation from her video and I was being threatened with more not only if I, but if anyone else made a video in my favor or shared proof of her lying about me. And to these emails, Peaches said, I hate to say it, but it contributed somewhat to my mental decline. And I'm sorry, but I just felt threatened, like I couldn't speak. And despite claiming to have such incriminating evidence against Peaches, to this day, Shannon has yet to provide any evidence. I watched both Shannon's video made on December 7th, as well as Luke's video on December 2nd, and for at least Shannon's accusations, they share pretty much the same story, bar some changes here and there, and the same consistent evidence. Little, if any, at all. But it seems that Shannon's affinity for drama wasn't something that started when she started YouTube. In fact, it seems that gossip and an interest in drama was a part of Shannon for a very long time. I just started lying about everything, which was not a smart move to do because I am in fact a shitty liar. I won't remember my lies very well and I tend up to end up exposing my damn self. In fact, evidence came forward that shows that Shannon has had a long time obsession with gossip, which led to her becoming an active member of LolCow. And if you don't know what LolCow is, which I didn't before this video subject, LolCow reminds me of basically a gossip version of Reddit, in which people can post about YouTubers and sort of gossip about them on the site. And I'm not going to pretend to understand it because I still don't know much about it, so I don't want to offend anyone, but I know that in general, there's sort of a powerful feeling behind being a faceless commenter. With anonymity, with anonymity, you can really say whatever you want without the shackles of it being tied back to you. And this allure of being an anonymous commentator is what drew Shannon into posting on lolcow. The only thing is, similar to some subreddits, lolcow is very against self-promotion, and that was something that Shannon was doing a lot of, which ended up getting her caught, and getting exposed for all the lolcow comments that she made. If you don't know, Creepshow Art, Shannon, has been accused of making nearly 300 posts from an anonymous account on lolcow that used transphobic, homophobic, and overall just childish and mean language to discuss her friends and many others. Lolcow is a website primarily used to gossip about pretty much anybody, but primarily celebrities, YouTubers, anything of the sort. Shannon has recently been accused of posting on the anonymous internet forum lolcow.farm, which is essentially a gossip site specifically targeted at online figures who have some semblance of an audience, whether that be influencers, YouTubers, or other types of content creators. Users are anonymous, which allows them to post their brutally honest, often extremely harsh or mean opinions of the online figures they gossip about. This is Creepshow Art talking about herself on lolcow. 
anonymously. Anyone talking about Creep is Creep herself, confirmed. And this was a comment on Locale that Creep Show made about her own video about having a stalker. I have a video on this channel about being catfished, and in that story time, I talk about my online friend Amy. Amy was the girl who would end up being my first online friend. The first person in my middle school existence who didn't say I was weird for liking what I liked, and also the person who went on to catfish me for about a month or two under the name Sasuke Uchiha 666. It was terrible. This particular cycle would continue for years. The person would go away for about three or four months and then come back for three months. Or they would be gone for six months and come back for one month. And every time it was different, but every time it was exhausting. Different emails were used every time I would get an email. And when I changed my emails just to see if it would stop, they would still be able to find it somehow and there didn't seem to be a way to make it stop. I watched it and it kind of explains a lot about why she says she's more used to getting hate. Her being on locale kind of seems like how she copes with shit after years of someone attacking her online. Makes sense why she is so standoffish. Also, her art in this video has improved a lot. Like she does hands and the colors actually work nice together. Anyone else notice that Creepshow art is being a scumbag and now featuring her followers art instead of her own? She can't even be effed to draw shit herself and is having her followers submit it and is saying she's doing it as a way to help them get exposure. D'Angelo is the guy that everyone pretends to like but no one really does. He tried to get in tight with a lot of them and because he talked about drama and made Holly look like a tool, they befriended him for safety. You are just as desperate as Creepshow, if not more so because at least she's the least bit self-aware. find that one ironic. Unless I missed something or Shannon was a bitch privately, Peaches is a sensitive baby and Shannon is our word. So as you can see from those locale posts, a different side of Shannon emerges online when she's posting anonymously and also Shannon hyper fixates on a few different content creators and posts gossip online about only a handful of these very specific creators that she's hyper focused on and she got exposed for it all. And this is the initial spark in the massive fire of controversy that was about to erupt. On June 2nd, 2021, a moderator for the online gossip form Lolcow outed the owner of an account they claimed belonged to Shannon. The admin for this particular form had revoked Shannon's anonymity and obtained numerous posts through Shannon's IP address after the user was discovered to have breached multiple form rules. These rules included anonymously advertising herself, deceptively posting about herself in the third person, and instigating or engaging in race-related arguments, among others. And when you look at their terms and conditions, the rules are pretty clear. Rule number eight, which states, do not attempt to use lolcow.farm for attention or profit. Rule number nine, which states, do not deceptively post about yourself in the third person for any reason. And lastly, rule number 10, do not advertise. In regards to topic specific rules, rule number two and rule number 3.2 are also relevant. Rule number two blatantly states, staff will revoke your anonymity if you attempt to deceive lolcow.farm. Rule number 3.2 also states, do not share names, pictures, or social media of people unrelated to the drama being discussed, for example, family members, friends, or co-workers. The admin also, embarrassingly enough for Shannon, created a full post history that compiled all the anonymous users' posts reflected by the IP they claimed belonged to Shannon. The admin traced the IP and cookies back to several locations associated with Shannon, which is impressive and something I don't think I would ever be able to possibly do. They also noticed that the device information they found matched all the devices that Shannon had been known to use. Certain information that further solidified the account having been connected to Shannon remained confidential due to the risk that she could be doxxed. Nonetheless, the admin was confident that the account belonged to Shannon and pointed out that they had done the same procedure to other creators posing on their forums and had yet to be incorrect. And that's how very soon the entire internet knew that Shannon had not only been self-promoting herself in this gossip forum, but also talking crap about her supposed YouTube friends. I do feel that this has to be a bigger problem because I just don't understand 
why someone would do this when their career is taking off, when their channel's taking off, they're experiencing success on YouTube, they're getting hundreds of thousands of views, have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and yet they spend a lot of their free time posting anonymously on a gossip site about people they're supposedly friends with. I don't understand the need to put in the time and energy into that and why Shannon wasn't satisfied with her YouTube following. I feel that the motive for Shannon has to be something deeper and more personal than any of us will probably ever be able to dissect because there seems to be a need to be involved with other people's lives and a part of their downfall. A need and obsession that was so strong for Shannon it caused her own massive downfall. But of course, I don't think anyone's perfect. We all do things that we'd be embarrassed if the public knew about and we all interact with people in different ways and in my videos, I try and put myself in the person's perspective and empathize with them and that's something that I sort of have been struggling with with this video. When I put myself in Shannon's perspective, I still don't understand the need to do this. The only thing I can think of is that Shannon may be struggling with such a deep insecurity, not only within herself but within her career, feeling maybe a certain level of competition with other creators and this need to post gossip about them and promote herself so she can try and stay on top, which is of course a false illusion created within Shannon's own reality if that was the case. Within the compiled locale posts, 292 of them posted from 2018 to 2021 included offensive comments, the majority of which targeted other YouTubers who uploaded similar content. Others included self-promotion, where Shannon would anonymously recommend the content on her YouTube channel and direct people to her Patreon and YouTube membership. But despite all of this, she was still caught red-handed and appropriately outed for all of her posts, which completely rocked her fan base and the commentary community. As many users in this thread are aware, Shannon's posts on Lolcal haven't been exactly subtle. We've decided to compile her post history after she escalated her behavior by sharing her sister's social media in order to deflect from criticism towards herself. I do want to say that Jem identifies as non-binary, but I don't think the locale admin knew this at the time of making this post. Beyond that, she has been anonymously promoting her videos and Patreon slash YouTube membership to farmers and making posts about herself to either white knight or insult herself. For many years, we've had a policy to reveal post histories of users who go to great lengths to use lolcow.farm to propel their own online presence, was the message from the locale admin. This situation was especially shocking because of the persona that Shannon portrayed herself as online. The beautiful little butt nuggets are going to hear some of the absolutely unacceptable things that have been spewed at the most lovely person online, that being Thuman, and leave a comment saying that it's wrong, she doesn't deserve this, and that she is so strong for dealing with things she is currently dealing with. And I just want someone to kill me, please. <sighs> also, side note, if you guys could do me a favor and go subscribe to my friend Black Wolf Company right now, I would love that. Okay, thanks, let's get into this. She acted like she cared a lot about moral issues. Why do we make being queer part of our identities? Why do we make being our true authentic selves so public when it's just so much easier just to not do that? And called out other creators for far less insensitive behavior. I come to find out that a lot of the things that she would tell me were just straight up lies that she made up in order to get me to protect her, but whatever. It's really fun and fresh to know that the majority of my friendship with this person, the majority of my feelings for this person were based off of lies, just lies for no reason. I mean, think back to the Hopeless Peaches situation where Shannon called out Hopeless Peaches for talking behind her back. And then you look at what Shannon was doing the whole time herself and it's a little bit mind-blowing, the hypocrisy of it all. I think Shannon's hypocrisy is most apparent in her Hopeless Peaches video where she literally stated, you are not going to be finding any time when I'm friends with someone where I even talk weirdly about them like this. And this is why the leaks came across as such a complete shock. And her behavior in these forums was shown to be the complete opposite of who she represented herself to be online and to her friends. As a result of the backlash, she 
Shannon responded in a post on her YouTube community page, where she alleged that the Lolcow account was run by a person named Amy, a pseudonym for a woman who stalked her for eight years. According to Shannon, the stalker acquired her IP address from an email and proceeded to spoof said IP address over the previous three years, and made numerous posts pretending to be Shannon in an attempt to defame her. Earlier today, I got a message saying that I had doxxed a relative, that I had been called out for saying certain things about myself and other creators, and more on a hate forum, and I was confused because I hadn't done that. I would remember doing that, especially the doxing. That's so firmly against what I stand for, and I don't believe in doing that, even to someone I loathe. However, after being sent screenshots of what I allegedly said about me, myself, my friends, and most importantly, my relative, I realized what had happened, Shannon said, and she explained that a video she had made years prior about a supposed stalker named Amy as a pseudonym, who she named Amy in the video, was the person who was behind this. But I also decided discussed how Amy and I kind of reconciled at the end of that and came to an understanding. She even liked the video and supported me making it. We kept in contact over the past couple of years, and I thought I kept a good amount of distance between us, never letting her close enough to hurt me again. Apparently, I'm really shitty at that. She later talked about how she did consider using a VPN to disguise her IP address. However, she decided it was unnecessary due to Amy's friendly and supportive attitude toward her and her channel. But I was wrong, Shannon said because she's been posting on certain sites, posing as me, spoofing my IP, doxing my family members, writing things about myself and my friends, sending me death threats from other accounts, making false accounts to spam my comment sections, spamming the comment sections of my friends, saying hateful things about me in order to get them to drop me, doing what she did years ago. That's not it, of course, but the amount of time and energy she's put into this is well beyond what I thought she was capable of, and as far as I can tell, she's been doing this well over a couple of years. And it's reasonable to sort of think huh, maybe it is someone who's been posing as Shannon doing this, because it was so out of character. However, despite her lengthy explanation, people started to poke holes in Shannon's story. Her response did not explain how the cookies or device types matched up to her, or how the location and IP changed over the years, accurately coinciding with Shannon's location changes. And many people explained in the comments section that you can't spoof cookies in the same way that you can with an IP address. So what Shannon ended up doing with her response is just confirming that at least one of the IP addresses in the locale post belonged to her, which combined with the other holes in her story cast more doubt and suspicion. And even without their input, this whole narrative of this being from a stalker who's trying to ruin her reputation makes no sense. Why would this supposed stalker also be promoting her YouTube channel, her Patreon, trying to get people to sign up for her YouTube membership? just on the off chance that the little cow admins revoke her anonymity and show all of her posts claiming them to be Shannon's. It's a little bit too thought out, even for a supposed stalker who's been stalking you for years and years. And as mentioned, Hopeless Peaches was one of the creators that Shannon often talked about in the little cow forum. She uploaded a video on June 11th, 2021 titled Speaking Up Against Creep Show Art. This is not okay. At one point in the video, Peaches talked about the posts that Amy made in the forum, where once she referenced a private conversation between Peaches and Shannon. Quote unquote, Amy claimed the conversation was spoken about publicly on Twitter. However, according to Peaches, she made no public reference regarding that particular conversation. It was purely a private interaction, and the only people that knew about it were Peaches herself and Shannon. There's a lot in this one, but um, <clears throat> besides the obvious, um, Shannon, I didn't talk about our conversation about your PK Russell video publicly in any capacity. This left no doubt in most people's minds that Shannon had to be the person behind the anonymous account, a disappointing revelation that was only the start of Creepshow Art's downfall. <laughs> And Hopeless Peaches wasn't the only friend that Shannon discussed on this forum who ended up speaking out about it. It's taken me a bit to make this video, and I know that a lot of people were demanding it. I know a lot of people were very understanding that I had to 
heal a little bit and then find more information before just jumping to make a video. On June 15th, 2021, YouTuber Ready to Glare uploaded a video titled About Creepshow Art. Glare was a close friend of Shannon's and was amongst other content creators who made videos in response to the Lil Cow leaks. She'd been my close friend for years and I didn't understand much about how IPs worked and spoofing and how, what's possible versus what's not possible versus what happens all the time. I was inclined to believe her because she was a friend of mine. For me, it was very much a real friendship offline. I met her in real life before the pandemic. We sent each other gifts. We both shared personal experiences that we'd had with each other that are private. You know, like we had a very real friendship. So my inclination was to believe her because I'm not going to run to believe that a friend is shit talking me on a website. According to Ready to Glare, in June of 2021, she received a message on Twitter stating that there were some negative posts about her on LolCow, but she decided not to look into it because she doesn't like reading negative things about herself, which I can relate to. It's really not a good feeling and just sometimes not good to even go there for your own mental health. Ready to Glare found out that Shannon was allegedly the one behind these locale posts and basically asked Shannon what the deal was. But Shannon denied the allegations to Ready to Glare and claimed that someone was spoofing her IP address. Later on, I find out via Shannon that people are alleging that she's posting this vile shit about her friends on LolCow. She tells me that it's someone impersonating her and spoofing her IP address. So she's not the one, there's someone pretending to be Shannon. That was the narrative. And in this video, Glare explained that she had been friends with Shannon for years, so she had no reason not to believe her and didn't really know how IPs worked. So she believed Shannon, and she even reposted Shannon's explanation of the whole thing, claiming that this entire incident was due to her stalker. But the following day, Ready to Glare looked into the comment section where she found a lot of people debunking Shannon's claims. I really was dead set on believing her because I didn't understand the IP situation, firstly. And secondly, like I said, it's hard for me to believe that someone that I'd been this close to would do that. However, the next day I saw comments and I began to look into IPs and spoofing and how all of this works because I'm not technically well versed in any of these things. I also then saw that an admin from LolCow had confirmed that the posts that you know, people were claiming were Shannon, were actually Shannon via confirming that her IP had been consistent. It became hard to believe that Shannon had been spoofed when she talked to more people and learned more about spoofing. They were all under the consensus that it was extremely unlikely that multiple devices were being spoofed over 300 times over multiple years. Like the probability of that being a reality was next to nothing. Basically, the only way in which this would happen would be that the person would have to be a professional hacker, and even the probabilities of that were low. And Glare struggled with the reality that Shannon wasn't who she thought she was. Oh yeah, someone sent me roses, but they also don't think much of me and are shit-talking me on a website. But when a friend hurts you privately, it's horrendous. When a friend hurts you publicly, it's equally horrendous, and it puts you in a very strange place where you have to explain things you might not know or understand. And Ready to Glare said that this entire situation took a massive toll on her physical and mental health. And according to Glare, Shannon didn't really volunteer much information at all. Even though Ready to Glare was desperate for answers and wanted to find any piece of evidence that would prove Shannon's innocence. The core thing was I wanted to find evidence. So as of now, I'm not here to give you the innocent or guilty guilty verdict. All I'm going to say is the LolCow admin confirmed her post. The last time it happened to me, it was true. And I believe that that is the most concrete information we have. And Glare ended the video by saying that no matter what Shannon said about her, the trust is lost and the friendship was diminished the second Shannon went behind her back. It's been a messy situation and I think everyone who was or believed to be friends with her is in the same boat as me, Glare stated. And it seemed that all the friends that Shannon once had, this network that she had built up through this persona that she portrayed to be, had shattered overnight with I'm sure a lot of people hurt and confused 
views. And the truth is, with social media and sometimes just in life itself, you never really know who someone is. That is, until they show their true selves to you. So, Shannon was exposed for secretly posting about herself and all of her supposed friends on a gossip website. Does that make Shannon a monster? Well, I suppose it depends on the person. So when this all came out, it was of course very embarrassing for Shannon, but not really deeply troubling until more and more information began to come out. And what ended up getting brought up by Emily Artful, another art YouTuber, was far more sinister than anything Shannon had ever done or been accused of doing before and things took such a dark turn that I don't think anyone was expecting it because Emily Artful released a video in a sense exposing Shannon for stalking her for years and years and years hi everyone I'm Emily. If you're not familiar with who I am, I have been making art content here on YouTube for the past six years. For the majority of those six years and several years prior, I had been facing stalking, harassment, and threats from one very recognizable source. And I wanna say quickly before we get into this, first off, this situation is a big trigger warning with lots of sensitive topics like eating disorders, and in general mental health. This is also a very strange story for me to cover because it involves so much private information on people's personal lives and I normally don't like to dive too much into that because I do feel like no matter the person, someone's privacy should be respected to a certain degree. But I will say that all of this information was stuff that was shared publicly by both parties. Both parties have openly talked about all this information. That being said, I'm still gonna try and navigate it in a respectful way. Way, since a lot of it is very sensitive information. On June 8th of 2021, days after the anonymous locale account and its posts were made public, YouTuber Emily Artful tweeted, This just needs to be said. This woman has tormented me for years and years. I know her because my ex-boyfriend dated her after me. I moved on, but she slash they continued to harass and stalk me. In this tweet, Emily Artful also attached a notes app post where she gave more information about how allegedly Shannon and her partner were harassing and stalking Emily Artful. A lot of people were shocked by this post because all of a sudden Shannon went from someone who used a gossip site to spread rumors about her friends to someone who was harassing, stalking, and threatening someone. And that was a huge leap. So people were shocked and they wanted more information. So Emily ended up gathering all the information she could to show to the public what she believed Shannon had done. On June 12th, 2021, Emily uploaded a two hour long video titled Creepshow Art Has Always Been This Way. And in this video, she chronicled the alleged abuse that Shannon and Anthony, Shannon's partner, had done to her. This stalking campaign has lasted the better part of a decade. And while I didn't know who my stalker was before, now I know who my stalker is. My stalker is Shannon, better known as Creepshow Art, and what I believe to be her current husband, Anthony Parker, who is also my... X. Emily claimed that this online harassment had started years ago, before Emily even had a YouTube channel. Anthony was a musician, and Emily is also in the music space. And after her and Anthony had broken up, she started working with him musically and noticed that that's when a lot of the online harassment began. And at this point, uh, the Emily Artful channel wasn't a thing yet. Um, I just had like random social media accounts. Um, I think I had a, a Minecraft account, an anime, I did short films, I had like a separate art account that was unrelated, a music account, um, and I started noticing a lot of really negative comments. Um, I didn't think much of it because that's just kind of, you know, the business on social media is you get negative comments. I figured it was normal, I was just seeing an increased volume in them. At this time, Emily also received a bunch of random Facebook requests from people that she didn't know, but since a lot of these accounts had mutual friends, she would accept the Facebook friend requests. And eventually, Emily was fished out of her Facebook account. Now, they ended up phishing me and locking me out of that original Facebook account. Phishing is when someone tries to 
to access your Facebook account by sending you a suspicious message or link that asks for your personal information. If this is what happened to Emily, the anonymous person who fished her account proceeded to lock her out, changing all the security details, including the recovery email. And through her Facebook, the hackers found inappropriate pictures of Emily from when she was only 15 years old. And although she tried to explain that she was only a minor in these images and that it was illegal to send out these images, the person who hacked her Facebook clearly didn't care. They took all the inappropriate pictures that they could find of Emily and put them in a photo bucket account, including other inappropriate pictures of Emily from a time when she webcammed. And they continued to hold this over Emily's head, threatening to release them one day. Now, I had had that original Facebook account since I was a minor, since Facebook came out. Um, and hidden in the messages of that account um, were some compromising photographs. Now, most of them were of me as an adult, but unfortunately, um, there were a few of me as a minor. Which I can't imagine the stress and mental toll that that takes on a person, thinking that compromising images of you could be released at any moment without your consent or permission. And I also just can't imagine what kind of person you have to be to do something like that. And this was probably the worst time that someone could threaten Emily, because at this time she was experiencing drug addiction. She was also battling an eating disorder and trapped in a toxic business relationship where she had no bodily autonomy. I had another domineering, powerful, abusive man in my life that was taking advantage of me in ways that I do not feel comfortable talking about publicly. Um, so I had no control. I had no bodily autonomy. I had no... Uh, I had no control. And throughout this time, Emily was trying to get back on her feet and create the life that she wanted, away from all this toxicity, which is such an admirable thing for someone who's going through various mental health crises and addiction, and meanwhile also had this stalker who was trying to destroy any chance that Emily had at recovering and leading a normal life. So in her efforts to get back on her feet, Emily tried to get a regular job as a receptionist, but this new job was found out by Emily Stalker, who sent her employers compromising videos of her and tried to insinuate that she was a prostitute or a dangerous person to associate with their business. I didn't really have control of much. I tried to get a regular job. Andrew and potentially Shannon found out about this regular job and decided to email my job and send them a compromising video of myself. They they posed as a client, said, I'm a regular client. You've lost my business because look at your, you know, disgusting human being of a receptionist. And this resulted in the company firing Emily, wanting to, I guess, keep their reputation clean or something. And that resulted in Emily being homeless. I actually ended up homeless for a period of time. So anytime Shannon talks about being homeless and having to live in her car, she did that to me. Which is a little bit ironic, considering I remember someone in this story talked a lot about having experienced homelessness, which ended up being by their choice. So Shannon was never technically quote unquote homeless. I mean, she was without a home, but in the traditional sense, um, her and Anthony were homeless by choice. And I know that because listen to what Anthony says in this video he posted on his YouTube channel in August of last year. So in this video, I wanted to go over what it was like to be homeless or kind of partially be homeless living out of a car for about two and a half, three years or so. And keep in mind, this was a conscious decision to do this. We didn't get evicted and thrown out on the street or something like that. We planned for this for about six months to about a year or so. I also want to know, something like this happening to you for years, someone holding on to compromising photos and videos of you, holding it over your head and using them against you whenever they can to get you fired from a job and basically ruin your life has to create a sense of paranoia in you. Constantly wondering, is this account my actual friend or someone who's gonna try and steal my information? Should I post about where I work? Or will that lead to me getting fired? So during this time, Emily worked as a receptionist, she worked at a restaurant and she 
was trying to work as a makeup artist, and she claimed in her video that Shannon and Anthony started posting reviews of her work, saying that she was unsanitary, that her brushes were dirty, and that she was basically really bad at her job, which prevented her from really being able to get off the ground as a makeup artist. So just imagine you're going through mental health struggles, you're going through addiction, and you're trying to get back on your feet, get your life together, get a job, figure out your career, and every step of the way, something's happening. You have to worry about this person who's trying to make your life a living hell. Now, I know a lot of you are probably wondering at this point, well, how does Emily know for certain that all of this is Shannon and Anthony? Anthony. And for due diligence purposes, I think it's important to point out that I myself can't claim that all of this was Shannon and Anthony. Really, the only two people that know that are Shannon and Anthony themselves. At the end of the day, the world is just strange and complicated. And I keep wondering, the more I look into this story, how someone could do all of these things. And yet, the allegations keep getting worse and worse, and no exonerating information has been presented yet. I guess the ultimate question becomes innocent till proven guilty or guilty till proven innocent. And does that even matter in the court of public opinion? Especially when evidence is presented that seems to be fairly damning, which we'll get into. After so many job opportunities were ruined for her, Emily realized that there was nowhere really to hide, so she stopped doing makeup, found a job outside of the town she was living in, and stopped posting online. And moving forward, Emily started to put her life back together and was doing really well for herself. She had started to experience sobriety and ended up creating her Emily Artful YouTube channel on May 15th of 2014. At the core, this channel saved me. This channel kept me back on track. You guys, this little community that we've built. I really feel like this channel saved me and continues to save me, she expressed. Then on January 23rd of 2016, Emily uploaded a video titled Sketchbook Storytime Stuck in a Blizzard Part 1, Self portrait, which was the start of a series that Emily created on her channel titled Sketchbook Storytime, where she would create a piece of art and also voice record a story time from a moment in her life. And these videos started to take off and were really popular, I think largely because no one was really doing this at the time, even though in 2016 that was sort of the story time era where story times were really taking off and becoming super popular. But then all of a sudden, after some time passed, Emily started started to receive comments asking her whether or not she knew about the channel Creepshow Art. Some claimed in the comments that Creepshow Art was copying her style and her content, while others claimed that she was copying Creepshows. In her video, Emily said about this situation, What was interesting is that I was getting these comments about this one YouTuber and nobody else. I feel like with art YouTubers, we all kind of borrow ideas from each other, but I was never compared to anyone else but Creepshow Art. Initially, Emily thought that these comments were kind of odd but didn't think much of it because she was new to YouTube and thought it just kind of came with the territory. This was until someone informed her that Creepshow Art had stolen her thumbnails as well as her sketchbook story time name. I got a comment um, of someone saying, um, hey, Creepshow Art has stolen a few of your thumbnails as well as your sketchbook story time name. Like she has completely ripped off your series. And so then my ears pricked up a little bit. Pretty much completely ripping off the series. But Emily, trying to be respectful, reached out to Shannon privately via DMs to try and politely discuss the similarities in a respectful manner. Hi Shannon, my name is Emily and I have a channel on YouTube called Emily Artful. It's been brought to my attention that you have a series with the exact same name as a series I created three years ago called Sketchbook Storytime. I'm going to guess this was most likely 100% by accident or by coincidence, but I put my heart and soul into my series and I'd really, really appreciate if you were able to change the name of your story time videos. And Shannon seemed kind of nice in these DMs. She apologized and credited Emily for pioneering sketchbook story times as a series, which is funny when you look at her locale post that has been allegedly linked back to her IP address in which she discusses this exact incident in a very different way. And after the respectful conversation, Emily followed Shannon on Instagram as a sign of mutual respect. And Emily explained at this time, back in around 2018, Emily did not know that Creepshow Art was married to Anthony.
Anthony, Emily's ex-boyfriend. Just a year before this, when Emily Artful's channel started gaining even just some initial traction, she posted on Twitter, feeling proud, I'm sure, in the moment, saying that she had a video that was taking off or had gone viral. And Anthony, her ex and Shannon's now husband, immediately followed her on Twitter and tagged her in a tweet, pretty much saying like, you're not viral, you just bought views. When she tried to block him, all these other accounts started to pop up saying the same thing. You didn't go viral, you just bought views. And Emily felt that this was sort of Anthony's personality. He wanted to sort of crush her motivation and destroy any chance that she had at success, which seemed like a very very similar characteristic to Emily's online stalker. So I believe at that moment, with him sort of harassing her on Twitter, she started to put two and two together and wonder, hmm, maybe Anthony is the one that's been stalking me online since their behavior is kind of very similar. So she gained the confidence to unblock Anthony and confront him on all of this, asking him why he was harassing her and pleading with him to just respect her. So I decided to unblock Andrew and confront him. Now, I do not have what I said to him, but I essentially said something like, why are you harassing me? Why are you doing this to me? He says back, harassing? No, I've only posted in what my accounts are. Like, what has my face on it? And I'm not angry. I was just curious. I figured maybe if I get more ridiculous, I'd get a response. I wanted to see where your stuff went, which is why I was bummed you blocked me. But no, I'm not angry at all. Thank you for the reason though, much appreciated. Emily describes Anthony as a scary guy to be with and recalled how she felt trapped in many instances, especially since she was vulnerable. But Anthony just sort of disregarded her entire message saying that he never created any sort of fake accounts or sock puppet accounts as they're called, that he wasn't the one that was harassing her and that the only account he ran was his own account. He also claimed that he never intended on harassing Emily and that he was just curious about her drastic increase in views. In the message, he said, I figured maybe if I get more ridiculous, I'd get a response. I wanted to see where your stuff went, which is why I was bummed you blocked me. But no, I'm not angry at all. Thank you for the reason though, much appreciated. Good luck out there. And that was the last that she heard from Anthony from, you know, his own account until she had the interaction with Shannon a year later, followed Shannon on Instagram. And then all of a sudden one day when she was scrolling on Instagram, a portrait of Anthony popped up. She realized that someone that she followed had drawn a portrait of Anthony. And when she saw the account, she realized that it was Shannon or Creepshow Art who had drawn this portrait. Imagine a colleague, cause let's say YouTubers are all colleagues in a sense. So imagine you have a colleague who you follow on Instagram and then all of a sudden they post a photo of someone and you realize that that's your ex. Even if it's just a weird coincidence, it still would be very weird and would probably make me very uncomfortable. But even at this point, Emily didn't even think that Shannon could possibly be the one that was stalking her. Instead, she thought maybe Anthony was also abusing Shannon or Shannon was also a victim of Anthony. She then talked about one of the most upsetting parts parts of this video, in which she described a sexual assault incident with Anthony that happened years prior when her and Anthony were broken up and Emily was still experiencing drug addiction. I had been using, he climbed in through my window and he had sex with me while I was incredibly um, and obviously intoxicated. In this incident, Emily explains that Anthony took advantage of her when she was in and out of consciousness and on hair. When talking about it, let alone even thinking about it, is still very difficult for me, and I'm still working through that trauma personally. I have no idea if he was in a relationship with Shannon at the time the assault occurred, but it seems like it's a possibility. I don't feel fully comfortable retelling Emily's story of sexual assault. I think it's really important that you go to her video so you can hear from her own words. So I'll include a link in the description of her video and timestamps where this discussion occurs so you can go and watch in full detail how Emily recounts this entire situation. Overall, from Emily's account, Anthony just seems like a very dangerous guy. On top of that, Emily recalls a situation where someone was harassing her via Snapchat and saying things in a voice that Anthony would typically say things. I wrote are you in my city? And Kilgore Trout is the name that they chose this time. 
And they said, somewhere, I suppose, in its labyrinth, I was 100% convinced that this person, Andrew or Shannon or whoever, was in my city and they were going to hurt me. And so at this point, Emily was absolutely sure that Anthony was her stalker and lawyers advised her to start keeping receipts of everything. So she started to carefully record and track everything that was happening to her. And she also decided to try and confirm whether or not it was Anthony, she was going to create a trap. So she created a trap where she sent one of the sock puppets accounts a link, pretending to be another person who disliked Emily's content. On the link, Emily attached an an IP tracker. And because her and Anthony had mutual friends, she knew exactly where he and Shannon lived. And Anthony fell for the bait and clicked the link on her message, which took Emily directly to where they were staying. On top of that, further proof that Anthony and or Shannon were behind the hacking incident and had been stalking her ever since then. When Emily's Facebook account was hacked, Facebook sent her an email where they showed her the location of the person who signed into her her account. The IP address pointed to the city where Anthony was from and where he resided in at the time. But at the time, she didn't think much of it considering everyone that she sort of knew in her small circle had come from that area. However, when everything else resurfaced, she began to realize that it was all Anthony. For the longest time, I thought I had two completely unrelated separate stalkers that were not related to one another and that they were just harassing me, that this was just a part of the YouTube environment, Emily stated. But I just kept thinking, I'm not relevant enough to have two completely unrelated stalkers. This can't be right. Which, if you think about it, having one stalker is probably more likely than having two separate stalkers who are acting in very, very similar ways. And it seems like for Anthony, and eventually for Shannon, this obsession with online harassing and stalking just grew and grew and grew. Statistics show that we all have a tendency to check up on our exes, but Anthony takes us to an entire extreme, extreme extreme. Instead of just looking up your ex's Instagram profile every once in a while and being like, hey, how's it going? Or what are they up to? I don't know. Instead, it seems that Anthony grew this obsession with being indirectly involved in Emily's life and started to track where she was working and how he could manipulate her and almost control her life even though he wasn't in it anymore. I'm not a psychologist or a therapist, so I don't want to psychoanalyze someone that doesn't even really have much of an online presence. But to me, this is reminiscent of how abusers and manipulators work, where they want so much control over your life and the most devastating thing to them is probably just not being involved in your life at all anymore. And and it seems that if that's the case with Anthony, he desperately tried to gain more and more control on Emily's life through becoming a stalker and taking control of her Facebook account and holding compromising information and images over her head so he could control her life even though he was mostly out of it. And Emily strongly believed that Shannon became heavily involved in this stalking as well, which you would sort of doubt if it wasn't for Shannon's lolcow posts, where her obsession with Emily really shows. Want to talk about Emily Artful? She full on has gone to small channels and told them not to do story times because they are her thing and her brand. Say it's a sketchbook story time. She said in problem with big YouTuber video that she's had to DM a bunch of artists to get them to rename it because so many people copy her and her creativity. She called anyone who does story times a clone of her because she totally invented that genre. Emily deletes a lot of her videos, but someone is re-uploading them. I mean, she did marry her husband after dating for less than a year. Like they met in April and were married in December. Not super bright. I feel like we neglect Emily on here a lot and she's so milky. Has anyone posted about Emily Artful's past of being an anti-feminist, anime-loving, I'm not like other girls girl? Here she's essentially trying to impress a bunch of neckbeards while they talk about anime girls they want to have sex with. Emily Artful uploaded two videos trying to explain her absence, when in reality she left because her views are terrible. Before she left, she was tweeting 
deleting and deleting about how bad her views were because no one wants a podcast of her talking with other artists. People want fake story times from her and that's it. That's why none of her other content breaks 100k. So she makes a video saying she almost killed her child two times because she got him sick, then when no one cared, pretended it was creator burnout. Someone posted about Emily's old Minecraft channel in her comments and it's just as bad as she is now. Definitely a lot of posts about Emily Artful in Creepshow's lol cow posts. And the weirdest thing about it is a lot of the information is Shannon bringing up random things from Emily's past, which sort of shows that she's been following Emily's past for a very long time and knows in extensive detail her entire internet history, which is a little bit suspicious. And Emily did note that she started to notice two different styles of voices being used in her stalkers. And she believes that those are when Anthony's talking versus when Shannon's talking. And I fully acknowledge that probably not all of those comments were coming from Andrew and Shannon. But when you've been stalked as long as I have, you can detect your stalker's language to the point where I could start to differentiate the voices between Andrew and Shannon. And what's really interesting is it was definitely Andrew in the beginning. Like, I really think Andrew just roped Shannon into this mean girl obsession with me. And Shannon kind of became the mastermind over time. I could see the transition from Andrew into Shannon. Which I'm just wondering, how do you get your partner into stalking and harassing one of your exes? And in my opinion, I think that the way that Anthony probably justified this was convincing Shannon that Emily was just an awful person who deserved this sort of harassment and abuse. Which it seems that Shannon did truly believe from statements that you'll see later on in this video. But I just feel like A, you either have to be a masterful manipulator to convince someone of that, and or Shannon maybe already had a propensity of liking gossip, of liking harassing people, which you can sort of see on her lol cow posts. And so this was sort of something that aligned perfectly with her interests and she really took on the role of being Emily's primary harasser. And all the while, I feel awful for Emily, probably feeling like you're going insane over the years wondering who is this? What's gonna happen next? Why is this happening to me? And how can I stop it? And Shannon, Anthony, if you're watching this, you have no idea what you guys have done to me. You think it's funny? You think it's something you can laugh about behind the scenes? You think it's retribution because I was a drug addict? You have, you have made my life so much more difficult than it ever needed to be when I was in an incredibly vulnerable place. And what you have done is sick and twisted and cruel. And I hope that you never have the chance to do that to anyone else ever again. Another reason why Emily believes that Shannon was the primary person who was stalking her is because Shannon's lol cow posts have really similar messages to what all of her hater stalker accounts were continually saying. These random accounts would say things like, Emily is a bad mother. Those were the same sentiments that were said on Shannon's lol cow posts. The information that these stalker accounts would bring up were almost identical to the information that Shannon would bring up on lol cow posts. So it all kind of connects in a way where you feel like it can't be a coincidence, especially when it comes to these obscure things from Emily's past that not many people are likely to know about. Once again, yet another reason that Emily believes that Shannon was also involved in the stalking is that one of the IPs that Emily tracked back was to a public library. And Shannon had talked about in a video how when her and her husband were homeless, they did a lot of their work in public libraries. I couldn't take it anymore, so I finally just decided I need to confront her. Are you the one that's been stalking me or is it Andrew? We can be candid now because I know it's one of you. Those fake accounts you've been making have led me right to Oregon. But still, Shannon just quickly denied that allegation and told Emily that her and Anthony were not involved in the stalking whatsoever. I said, I'm going to be filing a restraining order. I just have too much evidence to believe otherwise. Shannon said, no, I completely understand. Shannon said, do what you need to do, but it isn't me. It isn't Andrew. 
that's all I can vouch for. And at this point, I'm assuming Emily just being done in general, not trusting anyone, especially Anthony and Shannon, messaged Shannon saying that she would probably just want to get a restraining order still just to be safe. But she never had to because all of a sudden, after that message was sent, the stalking completely stopped. Shannon also in DMs even suggested that one of Anthony's close friends, Brandon, could possibly be the one behind the stalking. But after this interaction, Emily never received received another threatening or worrying message or comment again, further solidifying in her mind that it really was Shannon and Anthony who were doing that. It's important to note that we'll never really understand the truth of this situation. A lot of the information in this video is circumstantial, though there was a lot of receipts provided. And the evidence that Emily did portray in her video did paint a really compelling portrait of years and years of online abuse likely orchestrated by Anthony. The extent of Shannon's involvement isn't fully discernible, but it seems that regardless, Shannon has continued to stand by Anthony and his actions, as well as participate in at the very least knowing a lot of background information on Emily and making lolcow posts about that. Emily also received a suspicious message from a sock puppet account called Brita Filter claiming that their brother was the one that was stalking Emily. On July 19th, 2018, four months before I confronted Shannon, I received a Twitter DM from someone named Brita Filter. Hi Emily, you don't know me, but unfortunately, I know you. I want to explain this as clearly as possible, but it's very difficult for me to get my words out right now with everything I have found and what's going on around me. I don't expect you to reply, I just want you to know what happened because in a weird way it does affect you. My brother has been a quote unquote fan of you for a while now. He has apparently watched all of your videos and has them saved on his computer. There are some of you where you're singing and it's fairly grainy, all the way up to some that I see you are currently posting on YouTube. He has pages and pages of screen names information on you and things that I don't think any person should have on someone. Essentially, if you put it out on the internet, he has it. I also found screenshots of when he has harassed you. I only made this account to let you know what is going on because I felt that it was close to criminal for you to not know about something that so dearly affects you. I know when I was being harassed online at the age of 13, my trust in people went down because I couldn't know who did it. I want to tell you it was my brother, a boy you don't know, who at a very young age found you online and became obsessed. Which I think also confirms that Emily did have a stalker. Because you you always wonder, was it just a bunch of different random accounts? But getting a message from an account that claims that their brother is your stalker sort of just confirms that there is a stalker. There is someone who's doing all of this and they're either the brother of this alleged account or the person who owns this account themselves trying to cover for themselves and create an escape and sort of an out. Basically, this message confirms that Emily did have a stalker and that it was all just one person, whether it's this alleged brother or not. The anonymous account claimed they found significant evidence on their brother's laptop that confirmed that they were indeed Emily's stalker and that their brother had since been relocated to a mental health facility and will no longer be harassing her. My mom used to always say that lies are often the most detailed stories you can hear, and this definitely sounds like an overly detailed story. Emily proceeded to call their bluff, suggesting that the account contact her via video chat to talk about the story, but the Brita Filter account just conveniently explained that their parents weren't comfortable with them revealing their identity. However, they continued to wish Emily nothing but success and hoped that Emily could understand and forgive their brother one day. My theory is if this was Shannon who was messaging Emily under the Brita Filter account, Shannon probably realized at this point she had grown a very large following and being caught for something like this would completely destroy her entire career and everything she had built up on YouTube. And she probably realized it had gone too far for too long and it was finally time to put an end to it. Emily also believes that the account Brita Filter and the messages were a way to sort of send Emily veiled threats and kind of show her like this is all that we have on you. This Brita filter thing? Was Shannon trying to absolve herself of guilt while still holding something over my head? Like, hey, I'd really like for this to end, but if you ever come out with anything, 
here is a list of all the things that we have on you. Some things you didn't even know we had on you. Because in these messages, they detail out basically everything that they've collected over the years. In her video, Emily stated, as you can see, I'm still not 100% convinced that Shannon was involved at the time I was responding to Brita Filter. I was totally convinced this was Anthony, but after actually having a conversation with Shannon and seeing all of her lol cow posts and seeing patterns and her behaviors, I'm convinced that yes, Anthony started all of this. He was the one, the man obsessed, but then he roped Shannon in and boy oh boy did she become the ringleader ultra fast. Emily's video was well received by the YouTube community for being just sort of honest, raw, and explaining her experiences step by step while also providing disclaimers that this is sort of just her theory and that there's always multiple sides to every story, which I really respect. On August 22nd, 2021, Emily uploaded a follow-up video titled Creepshow Art Did Not Work Alone, where she kind of reiterated the most important points of her previous video, responded to some negative feedback, clarified certain situations, and used most of the video to provide additional proof, which included text messages from Anthony and Shannon and some of the Sock Puppet accounts mentioned as well. Once Emily announced that she was exposing Shannon and her husband Anthony, they deleted all of their social media accounts, which is definitely suspicious. I wouldn't say that's what an innocent person usually does. Once again, I just keep thinking every single time more allegations come out, this is this is too bizarre. This can't possibly be true. Surely Shannon's going to just disprove this because a lot of these allegations are fairly easy to disprove. And yet Shannon does the opposite and deletes all of her social media accounts and never responds to these allegations where it's like, okay, I want to hear the other side to this story, but you're not providing another side. So what's going on here? Is this really what's happening? After multiple people started sharing their experiences with Shannon, Jem decided to do the same. Jem, who uses they, them pronouns, is Shannon's sibling who Shannon doxxed on Reddit. Shannon posted a Reddit post about Jem, which had a lot of private and personal information, all shared from the perspective of Shannon and without Jem's consent. I ended up cutting her off because she hated my life partner because he was male. She had this useless vendetta against him since he came into my life and would constantly try to undermine our relationship. She would tell people he was awful to me and to get people extremely worried about my health when the truth of the matter is we were fine. It was a pretty typical teen drama. Past that, we broke up for a day and then got back together and she went on a Twitter spree ranting about how our relationship must be abusive which was subtweeting me as if I was a victim of abuse. And of course, since Jem's a private person, I do not feel comfortable sharing the details of that post in this video. And the way that this all came about was Jem was hospitalized in March of 2021 and reached out to Shannon, which I guess angered Shannon because Shannon hadn't heard from Jem in a while and led Shannon to dox them anonymously on lolcow. However, this action was the final straw for the lolcow admins and led them to exposing Shannon for all of her shady posts on the site. Although Shannon had referred to Jem as a female and with she, her pronouns in the Reddit post, Jem is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, making Shannon's behavior towards them somewhat trans phobic and insensitive at the very least, a sort of clearly disrespectful dig at Shannon's sibling. And so once others came forward against Creepshow Art, Jem did as well. They revealed that they caught Shannon in the act of spamming Emily Artful with hateful messages, which is a pretty strong allegation coming from your own sibling that really backs up Emily Artful's claims. They also revealed that they believed Anthony was a and that both Anthony and Shannon were capable of doing harmful things, which I do want to also provide a really important disclaimer here, and that's that being in an abuse relationship can take a massive mental toll on you and can completely manipulate the entire way you see the world. My very first relationship that I had was an extremely toxic relationship and once I got out of that personally, I realized what a fog my entire mind was in, that when I was in that relationship, I wasn't seeing things clearly. Not to say that if Shannon was Emily Artful's stalker, that it's justified because she was in a potentially abusive and toxic relationship, but I think it's 
it's important to add that clarity and that layer that I do believe that those types of relationships can drive someone to do things that they would never ever do outside of that relationship. On July 7th, 2021, Shannon reactivated her Instagram and made an Instagram story where she denied all these allegations. It was then reported that Shannon allegedly attempted to have YouTuber Gabby Hanna make a video about Ready to Glare, but such a video was never made. On January 1st, 2022, Creepshow Art uploaded a lengthy response video titled The Lies of Emily Artful with Evidence. As many have already mentioned about Shannon's response video, most of the video included needless and irrelevant context about Emily's personal life and past when she was a child and minor that was, I guess, used to somewhat discredit Emily's story by proving that she was not a good person during her adolescence, something that Emily has already touched on before and has admitted numerous times. I feel like I've come very far and I've done a lot of work on myself. That is the number one thing I advocate on my channel is reflect, 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 um, and, and you know, learn to acknowledge and own up to your mistakes. Though I do want to say, no one will really know what Shannon is truly responsible for, and the truth may be a gray area or something that nobody expects. We may eventually find out the truth, or we may never know what the real truth is. So I want to try and share Emily and Shannon's sides equally and as fairly as I can so that you can draw your own conclusion, which could be completely different from my own. The introduction of the video was an opening statement which tried to set the precedent that the entire video was legally sound and produced with the assistance of a legal team. Shannon herself stated that if you watched the video, it meant one of two things. Either her lawyers negotiated with Emily's lawyers and have reached a private settlement which resulted in some retraction, or Shannon took Emily to court for defamation and quote unquote came out the other side. If you are seeing this video, it means one of two things has happened. Either one, my lawyers negotiated with Emily's lawyers and reached a private settlement, which resulted in some form of retraction, or two, I took Emily to court for defamation and came out the other side. But this was just not a factual statement, which is a bizarre thing to start out a response video with. Upon the release of this video, Emily tweeted that her team had not received any news concerning an official lawsuit from Shannon or her team. She explained that Shannon only threatened to file a lawsuit for defamation if Emily did not take down every mention of her and her husband from her videos, which Emily denied. Shannon then claimed that the video was made for posterity, to show that I didn't do what I was accused of, and to show that what Emily has accused me and my husband not only never happened, but could not have happened. Shannon also stated she would go through Emily's video point by point with evidence showing how she's lied on the screen, and that Shannon was going to leave links in the description box to show everything she's talking about so that the audience can verify their authenticity. She also said that Emily only claimed Shannon was her stalker as a safeguard so that when they brought forward all the receipts they allegedly found, Emily could point towards that and call it evidence of their stalking. I get that it's sort of a conundrum, you either find receipts to prove you're innocent but that doesn't help the stalker case, or you do nothing and can't prove or disprove your innocence. That being said, I feel like if you're innocent and trying to show that you're not a stalker, it makes no sense why you would feel the need to go over every single detail of the other person's life that doesn't have anything to do with the topic of hand and doesn't really help the whole I'm not a stalker point that you're trying to make. Emily has been posting online to various accounts since she was 13, all of which have been verified to belong to her. Emily talks about stalking her teacher in various posts, something she admits to doing in her video uploaded in 2016 titled My 7th Grade Flip Flu. Fun fact, I had a fucking huge crush on my teacher. It's just embarrassing and shameful, so you'll see him randomly in here. If Shannon and Anthony solely collected evidence that cleared them of any wrongdoing, then people would have no problem with them taking months to collect information on Emily and the situation. However, most of their video did the complete opposite. The information taken from Emily's past had nothing to do with proving their innocence and didn't necessarily disprove that they weren't stalking Emily, and instead was just used to try and paint Emily as an unreliable source and further push their 
narrative rather than clear their names. This account on 9gag went by the name Snacky Packy, using Emily's image, her stated profession, and would comment on posts of women stating that they weren't as attractive as she was, that anyone who was overweight was just lazy and should stop eating, and that most men were intimidated by her because she's attractive and smart. Which is the same thing Shannon did with Hopeless Peaches, which initially worked for her when she was getting pushback from that situation. But this entire thing is a red herring or straw man argument. I always get those two mixed up. Instead of actually proving you're not the one stalking Emily, which I think could actually be easy to at least refute some of those claims if you didn't, instead you don't even disprove that and try to distract from it by trying to talk about how Emily is a bad person, which is also an ad hominem attack, a logical fallacy where instead of disproving something or arguing against an argument that's being presented, someone tries to bring up the character of the person making the argument to try and discredit what they're saying. In the next section, Shannon tries to discuss the relationship between Emily and Anthony. Shannon referenced a story time Emily uploaded where Emily claimed she only had two bad relationships in the past, and she questioned why she never mentioned Anthony. In her My Ex-Girlfriend Destroyed My Art video, Emily states that she has only had two bad relationships in her entire life. Why Anthony was not mentioned as being a terrible relationship at that point, I do not know. Emily and Anthony dated for three to four months in 2011. Shannon insinuated in this section that since Emily never made a video about Anthony and their past, Anthony must not have really been that bad, or it all must have never happened. Emily stated that she tried her best to avoid mentioning him or provoking him under the assumption that he might find her and harm her physically. The video then took a very, very strange turn when Shannon spent a good portion of the video trying to debunk Emily's drug abuse claiming that she was sober during her relationship with Anthony because of his no drug policy, which that's a little bit weird to have in a relationship, a policy. <laughs> Interesting. Shannon showed screenshots of Emily's social media posts from when she was younger, disavowing drug abuse as though everything a teenager posts online is 100% the truth. It's important to note that everything told in this section is likely coming directly from Anthony, who could just be lying to save his reputation. And what does this happen? to do with anything anyways. Why does any of this matter? Addiction and substance abuse are topics that are very complicated, and someone's path to sobriety is their private matter. I have people in my own family, as I'm sure many watching can relate, who have been functional addicts for years and were able to hide it very well. Not that it even matters whether or not that was Emily's situation, because this has to do with literally nothing, and just kind of shows that Shannon and Anthony are both extremely invested in Emily's life, which is just very strange. They then take a deep dive into Emily's mental health history and show posts that Emily made as a minor discussing various mental health diagnoses and potential violent tendencies. So yesterday I took my sketchbook with all the pictures of him. I sort of forgot this, but I took it and I shredded every page I had onto the floor. Then I slammed my head against my desk until my head felt like it was stopping and I felt like, oh, it felt like it was bleeding and I gave my head a good rattle, so I fell asleep on the floor that night because I was too out of it to get ready for bed. Overall, it makes no sense why someone would feel the need to go there. And also, this wasn't something Emily did at all towards Shannon and Anthony in her initial video. Emily, in her initial video about Anthony and Shannon, solely discussed her past openly and honestly, and rarely gave out personal or compromising information on Anthony and Shannon. She never dug back through their past posts unless it related to their story and her interactions with them. And it's all bizarre because in the video, Shannon admits that Emily was abused by numerous partners, that she was an addict, that she had a erratic and dangerous behavior when she was younger, but yet simultaneously discredited anything Emily said about her own past and story. She wasn't an addict when she said she was an addict. She wasn't abused by the people she said she was abused by, which is a bizarre take of someone who's claiming to not be a stalker and yet simultaneously saying, I know your life better than you do. <laughs> Instead of talking about the allegations of stalking, Creepshow Art mainly tries to attack Emily's character and tries to imply that Emily's not a reliable source due to her previous struggles with mental health. It feels like the entire video is basically saying you shouldn't trust Emily when she says we're stalking her because she's a bad person and trust us. We've been following her every move for years. We know her and most of the video was hyper focusing on the allegation of Anthony assaulting Emily and saying that it couldn't be true and Emily's unreliable but sexual assault is all about consent and if Emily is firm in that the situation was not 
non-consensual, it was sexual assault, regardless of her mental state. I do want to say at this point in the response video, as a complete outsider who's not an expert in abusive relationships, it's a major red flag that most of Shannon's video is defending an allegation made against her husband. Instead of disproving her involvement or focusing on the allegations made against her, most of the video almost feels like it's coming from the voice of Anthony, Anthony's story, and why Anthony didn't assault Emily. It is a red flag to me that Shannon used her platform to speak from the words of her husband virtually and gave very little time for actually standing up for herself. This video just creeps me out as a whole because my gut tells me why is this video's sole focus on refuting all the allegations against Anthony but not the main one of Shannon being a stalker. This whole thing feels like Anthony's video and not Shannon's. There was a point in Shannon's video where she recalled a story time Emily told where she was 17 and dated a 13 year old. Penny was a beautiful, charming young girl. We got along incredibly well. She was exactly my type, both physically and mentally, or so I thought. And the only possible foreseeable downfall to our relationship at that time was that she was a little bit immature and she was a little bit immature because she was four years my junior. But Emily made a post on Twitter where she clarified that the 13 year old in the story was actually herself, that she was the child in the situation and that it happened more than once. She explained that where I would be tormented about an embarrassing, drunken, or drugged up encounter but wanted to tell the story to get it off my chest, I'd reverse the roles. I learned in therapy that I did this as a form of self-punishment. Regardless, it was still wildly inappropriate to talk about. And this whole thing feels reminiscent of such an old way that people have discredited sexual assault survivors for decades by basically saying, don't trust them, they're crazy. And to see it so blatantly done like this, I mean, most people could just see right through it. The rest of the video focused on Emily's past online, like her first social media accounts when she did camming, and her initial YouTube videos. Emily's first YouTube channel, I believe, was a channel named Emily Sugarfruit, and Anthony and Shannon showed in their video some of the controversies Emily faced on this initial channel. On the Sugarfruit channel, Emily ended up doing a couple of controversial things, like posting an anime review in a bathtub. The video of her in a bathtub caused a lot of anger in the community because the YouTube anime community is filled with mostly men who saw Emily doing that as a cheap way to get subscribers and attention. I had a YouTube channel before. I don't know if you guys knew this. I did anime reviews and the community was just very aggressive and mean and stalkery and, and it just, it wasn't a great community. Which I mean the entire thing. How can you not realize this just exposes how much of an uncomfortable amount of information you know about Emily's life? I think literally the only thing which I could maybe see in Anthony and Shannon's favor, which I know I shouldn't even be saying that after the egregious things they brought up about Emily's past, but I will say the only thing that made somewhat sense in this video was when Anthony and Shannon responded to Emily's story about being fired in 2013 after someone anonymously emailed her company a compromising video of her. Anthony and Shannon claimed that this incident along with other incidents are things that Emily could have misconstrued as caused by Anthony and Shannon. For example, Emily's hacked Facebook account and an alleged photo bucket account that held compromising photos of Emily. In Emily's video, she alleged that the person that hacked her Facebook account impersonated a friend of hers to fish information about Emily and to find out where she worked at the time. And Shannon did provide valid points as to why this probably wasn't Anthony who was doing this because Anthony was already friends with Emily on Facebook at the time. And Emily Emily posted screenshots on Twitter where in the past she told Anthony where she worked. Therefore, why would he need to create an account to find out specific information he already knew? After she got clean in November of 2012, she and Anthony became Facebook friends themselves, meaning that he wouldn't have needed to make a fake account to get information on her the way she says. She debunks this claim herself without realizing this on Twitter by showing their Facebook messages from this time, where she directly tells him where she is working. Although there is also a possibility that this impersonated account could have been made for other reasons. However, it should be noted that Emily did receive an email from Facebook around the time her account was hacked that included the location of whoever hacked her account and the IP address pointed to the city where Anthony resided. 
Shannon then addressed Emily's second job as a makeup artist. Emily accused Anthony and Shannon of leaving a negative review that resulted in her losing a big client. This then led to Emily leaving her job, finding another job out of town, and minimizing how much she posted online in an attempt to avoid harassment. Shannon argued in her video that Emily disproved her argument on Twitter when she posted a screenshot of her conversation with Anthony. In the messages, she explained that she was about to start work as a makeup artist after she got her certification. However, above the tweet itself, Emily clarified that she never received her license and instead advertised on social media and got clients through Craigslist. So Shannon questioned how she and Anthony could have left a negative review if her audience came from social media, since she was not an established business online, which is somewhat a valid argument. Emily didn't provide a lot of detail of what the review was or how it was received, so it's hard to say whether or not Shannon's argument is credible. I really think this was the only somewhat credible argument that Anthony and Shannon made in this response video, but I also can understand from Emily's perspective when you're receiving so much hate and creepy messages and creepy things happening to you, you're gonna think it's all connected and you're gonna think that any sort of obstacle that you encounter in your path of trying to recover and create a life for yourself is gonna be the same person who's already been targeting and harassing you. Shannon then stated in her video that all of this sort of odd creepy tweets that Anthony would send to Emily was just him joking. Like, that's just his sense of humor, which I find interesting because that same sort of benefit of the doubt was not given to Emily in Emily's past tweets and posts. This whole video is also just really sad because Shannon used to be someone who would speak up against abusers and uplift victims, and this video just took such a sharp turn into discrediting someone's story and their character and deflecting so heavily. The change of character is jarring. Shannon throughout this also claims that the account Brita Filter was the one that knew all this information on Emily and decided to send it to Shannon, which makes no sense because it's not like Shannon and Emily were publicly super connected online or known to be enemies. There was really no reason why an account called Brita Filter would send all this compromising information to Shannon alone. I think the weirdest thing too is that a lot of the video is looking through Emily's posts from middle school, which like everyone's middle school posts are embarrassing and cringy. My middle school posts are probably so awful. Everyone's are if they did post online or if you had a diary, if you read through that now, it's probably very cringy because you're just a child and you're kind of going through these emotional changes and growing up and anyways, why does any of this matter? When Shannon initially uploaded this video, she also pinned a comment that said, any comment asking why didn't you address blank or blank or what buttmuncher75 said about you in the video with 45 views, if they didn't accuse me of literal felonies, then I really don't care at the moment. There's a difference between people thinking I'm a dick and someone saying I committed a literal crime that are so foul that if I was seen on the street by someone and recognized, I'd be assaulted. There's a reason Emily got a legal notice and other people didn't, because one thing is more serious than the other. If you can't understand that, then one day I hope there never comes a time when you can relate to this because it's terrible. Touch grass. But most of these points were not something Emily touched on in her video and were kind of just there to smear Emily's name, in my opinion. <laughs> On February 9th of 2022, Emily Artful uploaded a video titled, I'm Done, Shannon, where she responded to Shannon and Anthony's allegations and clarified a lot of situations. I feel like at the very least, I should be allowed to not only talk about my side and to disprove some of the more egregious examples of misrepresentation, but to also come clean about a few things and to be open and honest about my past. Which she shouldn't have to do about these situations that happened years and years and years ago. Bizarrely, I think this is one of the situations where the general public didn't really care about Emily's past. She openly admitted to things that she had done wrong way before this all came out, took accountability for herself, and apologized to the people she may have offended. So people didn't really care about that. And Shannon's video didn't talk about anything else but the thing that people already didn't care about. Emily revealed that Shannon's lawyers had emailed her and threatened to take her to court for defamation unless she removed every mention of Shannon and her brand from her social media. They also requested that she make no mention of the letter sent while deleting everything. And of course, Emily Artful refused this because what did these lawyers think? That she was 
dumb enough to be like, okay, let me just delete all of this and not say a word to the public. And Emily believes that this was both Shannon and the lawyer's attempt to deceive her and deceive the public by basically making Emily delete all of these videos right before Shannon uploaded hers to make it look like Emily was in the wrong, Shannon was right, and also not give Emily an opportunity to defend herself whatsoever after basically this entire video just bashing her relentlessly came out. And Emily described it perfectly when she said they wanted to shut her up by way of legal intimidation, then tear her down publicly and watch her squirm in silence. According to Emily, Shannon's lawyer belonged to a law firm that specialized in removing negative reviews for businesses. So that was sort of their goal. They saw Emily's video as a negative review against Shannon's brand, which is a little bit different when you're talking about allegations of stalking and harassment, but go off. Shannon's lawyer, who I will not be identifying publicly, belongs to one of those law firms that specializes in things like removing negative reviews, removing unfavorable articles, and I roughly quote, helping their clients control the narrative about their brand and business. It seems to me just by going over their website and like their client reviews that their main tactic to controlling the narrative is by way of sending long and threatening letters to scare people into removing their reviews or posts or what have you. It seems like most of the time, this is all it takes. It seems like what happens is that the clients pay a flat fee to co-write a scary legal letter to their detractor. The detractor doesn't want to go to court, so they give in. I refuse to do that, and I think Shannon, now having no real recourse, because I don't think she wants to go to court either, she threw a temper tantrum and said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm taking this bitch down with me, and then posted her video. Emily believed that the only thing Shannon's video proved was that she had in fact been incessantly stalking Emily for years, which agreed. Why would you post a video like this? See, this is where I get really concerned about Shannon's mental state and well-being because what kind of mental state do you have to be in to think, here's a video I need to post when I'm being accused of being a stalker. It's a video on every single bad thing Emily has ever done ever from the time that she was just a very young teenage girl all the way up until now. You see how you are proving everyone's point. Emily described the video as a mere smear campaign to get anyone that Shannon could on her side, which I can definitely see that. But I also just think Shannon was roped into stalking Emily Artful through Anthony because she was convinced by Anthony that Emily Artful was a really terrible person because of this reason and that reason of things Emily had done in her past. And for whatever reason, the arguments Anthony presented was convincing enough to rope Shannon in and think all of these stalking and harassing actions were justifiable because of who Emily was as a person. And I think in Shannon's mind, she thought that other people would feel the same way if she presented these same arguments. But the reality is that that entire logic is deranged. It's not logical. And the general public doesn't feel that way. No matter what someone did in their past as a teenage girl or whatever, it does not justify stalking them for years and years and years and holding information against them. Emily also noticed that most of the evidence Shannon supplied came from deleted or defuncted accounts and videos, which she would have had to archive when they were first available. Emily also expressed her displeasure with Shannon using posts she made as a mentally ill child, going through constant and drastic psych medication changes and evaluations as some sort of attempt to smear who she is now as an adult. It's just so far out of left field. Emily referenced another YouTube channel named La Copy Art, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, who discovered a clip from one of Shannon's past videos where Shannon Shannon seemingly contradicted herself regarding someone's behavior as an adolescent, reflecting their overall image as an adult. In this video, Shannon acknowledged that children should not be demonized or labeled as terrible people for making mistakes because their brains are still developing. It's f***ing wild how people treat this literal child online. Like, there is a creator who is literally 14 who people want to call every name in the book because she acts like a creator who is 14 years old. She is 14 and people are having post threads about why she is the worst person in the world. And I'm just sitting there like, that's a child! guys. People often forget that pretty much until you are about 25, your mind is in a constant state of flux, and you are constantly learning and changing and growing into yourself. Yet in her video about Emily Artful, she repeatedly did this. She failed to provide any recent examples as to why Emily is an awful person. And all of her evidence was just from instances of Emily as a child when her brain was still developing. On top of that, in this video, Emily found further proof that her and Anthony were in contact at the time this 
sexual assault took place and provided screenshots of messages where she was openly talking to Anthony about her substance abuse at this time. The amount of detailed information that Shannon provided in this video was creepy. It was creepy, like creep show art. Shannon made a list of different aliases for Emily, including the various names and nicknames Emily used on different social media platforms. And all of this required deep knowledge of Emily's entire past history online and various accounts that she's used throughout the years that now don't exist anymore. So it's kind of impossible for you to stumble upon all this information present day without having followed Emily's tracks for years. I just find it weird because having a list of every single alias and username I've ever went by online is something that the Brita Filter account mentioned. It just seemed really coincidental, Emily stated. Emily also touched on Shannon's continual denial of any struggle that Emily has ever gone through, like claiming that Emily never went through an eating disorder, never had mental illness struggles, wasn't addicted to drugs at the time that Anthony assaulted her, and so on. It's so backwards to me that Shannon accuses me of faking eating disorders, of faking mental illnesses, when clearly in a lot of these posts she's using, I am not well. Not only this, but she's been very outspoken about mental health and eating disorder awareness before, Emily stated concerning Shannon's hypocrisy. Emily also said that who Shannon claimed Emily called abusive was just not correct at all, which also, can you imagine just drawing up a diagram and being like, this is who abused this person and also why this person's lying about this abuser and that abuser why this is not your business whatsoever that person has a right to come forward with that information if and when they feel comfortable and it is not your place whatsoever emily also said that everything shannon said about who did and didn't abuse her is completely incorrect emily would sometimes tell story times switching around characters and details and even switching around herself and the other person in the story making herself and who she was into the sort of villain of the story as a weird way of coping with the situations that she went through. The storytime videos I made about certain relationships were mostly for entertainment, and although the stories were real, many identifying facts and information had to be changed or switched around between other story times. I would deliberately switch the roles around, change the details, and retell the story with me as a protagonist instead of the clumsy, embarrassing, chaotic, or drunk. Which story times on YouTube are in general for entertainment purposes only. No one takes a Tana Mojo story time at face value, or at least no one should. And I feel like this is kind of the same way. They were entertaining, they were an outlet for Emily, and they weren't something that you should categorize who did and didn't abuse her. And if Emily never talked about an abuse in a story time, it must have never existed. And the worst part of all of this is Shannon ended up accusing people of being abusive to Emily that weren't and that were actually important figures in Emily's life, like the person Bob, who Emily ended up inviting onto this video to clarify that he was not an abusive figure in Emily's life. In the PDF letter Emily received from Anthony and Shannon's lawyers, Anthony admitted to a sexual encounter occurring after their breakup. Emily believed Anthony only mentioned their sexual encounter because there is evidence of them planning meetups and speaking sexually with one another long after their breakup. Emily's response to this video is that it just kind of proved the intensity in which Shannon monitored her life, basically meticulously archiving and screenshotting every post, contradiction, and disturbing thing she did. The part that gets me is that when I showed clear improvement, growth, and development as a person, when I was becoming more healthier and more self-aware, that's when she chose to come down on me the hardest. When I showed compassion to others, when I made friends, had healthy functional relationships, that's when she chose to torment me the most. When things were starting to get back on track for me is when her targeted harassment was at its worst, as if bettering myself was what made her angry and not necessarily my problematic past actions. She does a whole lot of talking about how she doesn't know me and how she doesn't care in her video, all while stuffing every tiny insignificant detail about my life that has nothing to do with the general points she wanted to make. In the video, Emily also clarified that she never directly accused any one person of stalking and only made vague and anonymous accusations because she was unsure of where the harassment came from. I even said in my original video that yes, I had experienced some online harassment before, but it was much more generic and milder opposed to the more targeted, obsessive, and vindictive stalking that we're talking about here. 
Emily also noticed the strange parallels between Shannon and her video and the Brita Filter account's supposed 15-year-old brother, who they claimed had been Emily's stalker. Both people, this is assuming they're not the same person, were fixated on similar points within Emily's problematic past. More specifically, the bathtub video, the accusations concerning Emily buying subscribers, and the receptionist job where Emily was abruptly fired. Not to mention, Brita Filter alluded to a video that Emily had only ever sent to Anthony, and had compiled a list of almost every screen name Emily created online, which was what Shannon did as well. I realize that two people can have the same information, but really, what is the likelihood of two people conveniently having every last detail of every screen name and post an account I've ever had online, deleted public or otherwise, Emily stated. What is the likelihood of a supposed young child getting their hands on a video that I only sent to one person and the unlisted link that I sent to Anthony came from an account that's never been hacked? In fact, all the views on that unlisted video came from the same link. Emily also noted that Shannon's diatribe on Emily's previous anime YouTube channel was another topic mentioned in the lolcal posts. Not only that, but a similar timeline of Shannon's perception of Emily's drug addiction, and the mention of a private conversation that went on between Shannon and Emily regarding their similarities in content was also present in the low-cow posts. Emily stated at the end of her video that while she provided evidence that she thought incriminated Anthony and Shannon, she urged people to draw their own conclusions. Meanwhile, in Shannon's video, she did nothing but grasp at every straw she could, even if that meant portraying a very skewed version of the truth. Emily acknowledged there were three sides to every story, explaining she did not want to smear Shannon's character, but instead have people listen and believe her story. She reassured her audience that she had taken extra precautions to ensure her family was safe and thanked everyone for their overwhelming support, officially closing this chapter of her life. Creepshow Art hasn't posted again after the first response on Emily Artful, and it's been six months since Emily Artful's initial video was posted, and since then not one piece of exonerating evidence has been found or shown, and it's not looking good for Shannon. Our legal system emphasizes innocence until proven guilty, but the internet isn't exactly the same, and in the court of public opinion, Shannon is guilty and Creepshow's time on YouTube is finished, and the real truth of everything we may not know. I wish I could end this video and the story of Creepshow in a more definitive way with a little bit more closure. Life doesn't always give us closure, and in the real world, there are many mysteries that may never be solved.